to a complete standstill and everybody can just chill. And of course if you hear shit you can and otherwise you just and uh [laughs] Yeah. [laughs] I was trying to keep it neutral so you wouldn't get offended. [noise] No [noise] Mkay. Well you can't really like other people or anything after [noise] No uh there's uh a lot of it left isn't you'll probably kill me if you think I'm gonna kill myself. Yeah. [laughs] Uh I'm not gonna kill you. [noise] Okay If you kill yourself first I'll kill you. [laughs] How does that make sense? [laughs] [noise] That makes more sense than your ways of doing things. [laughs] [laughs] Why would you do that? [laughs] Uh I don't know because I could just lie, say I'm fine and then just get screwed over right away. Yeah Well if you had the whole thing no one problem would kill you but anyone who's never tried to kill you would probably kill you [laughs] Yeah that's what I'm thinking [laughs] Yeah oh no I don't know if if you kill yourself first people will probably think you're crazy [laughs] Yeah no that's what I'm thinking too. [laughs] I mean like that guy's like slightly blue build yeah I mean couldn't be anything else. No that's what I'm thinking too. Like I think the the person who is trying to kill me is also psychotic Yeah Um they like having beans but I mean this one was was on the pea tree this one. Yeah But uh I'm we have we've had we have red carpet through the garden, ground floor level. Sorry dude Mhm Because you're sitting having the breakfast right down here and it goes straight past the the thing on which I was sitting, so you should be sitting close to it. But I'm sitting thinking like, ah you probably like fall out or something. But it's it's amazing what turns up if you watch it. [laughs] [noise] Well yeah I've I've seen like shots of that that apartment with the But you know the part we had was was amazing in the driveway there though. Probably like the front porch. Was it not? Yeah, yeah. Front porch or the the patio or something like that and we were just like, "Woah" [laughs] Oh okay. Yeah we got that. Um we we drove by a few times and we weren't impressed. Yeah No this 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 was about a week ago [laughs] [laughs] Oh okay. Yeah but yeah if you're watching enough and I used to do the garden bird watching I used to be watching you know for an hour every day or something like Um the things that crop up when you're spending that much time watching them that you probably otherwise would miss. Big time man Yeah They're everywhere. Yeah you'll never miss them. They're not just like little parks around here. Yeah well I I just outside my house in the garden, so [laughs] But it's really cool I can go by the houses cuz there there are fielders out here And there's a lane and there's a field opposite and the field at the back yeah. Mhm It's probably like five minutes from here It's probably like ten minutes Yeah But that's still a difference of six minutes over there. Well Ten minutes? Fifteen minutes more Yeah My time's up. [laughs] [laughs] Yeah Six minutes? Would've still called like a minute over there. Well Yeah. It's all my relatives [laughs] [laughs] Yeah I got nothing. Nothing Wasn't it funny though to see the the uh You know the uh that Canadian couple over there just having like a finger eating the like goat cheese thing? [laughs] [noise] So they're in Vancouver. Yeah Right Yeah And they're like, "Oh let's let's try this place out." And they've never been in Vancouver. Yeah Except for Paul. No, they've been to Vancouver before. Yeah Oh yeah? Yeah and they liked it What was it like? It's not Vancouver and they're like, "Oh yeah we're just having our time." [laughs] [laughs] But it's like it's like a thirty minute drive from here It's not bad. Yeah it's not bad at all. But it's just kinda ridiculous. [laughs] [laughs] Yeah Kinda deal breaker. Hmm Yeah Yeah we've had a few of those, we just haven't been using them where they usually get used. Oh yeah [inaudible 0:32:47.70] It's not super common where you find these little those indoor farms Yeah I haven't been actually cuz I haven't been out of the house yet but you're right [laughs] [inaudible 0:32:47.70] It does [laughs] Yeah You're okay, pretty much. Yeah Oh yeah That's wonderful. [laughs] Yeah Yeah that's wonderful. Yeah Um I'm so glad that I did not wear long pants today. Yeah, it's hot hot. It's hot hot hot. [noise] Is that cross stitch? It is. It's a sas- it's a cross stitch sa- oh like it's like cruel work. This Yeah she made it for a s- a set prop for [laughs] Some cabin thing? Yeah No it was for her ex boyfriends uh video movie project or something. Mm They needed the head of sasquatch obsessed character, so they needed decorations for his house. Yeah, you'd have to be very obsessed with it to go to the time and effort to do something like that of a sasquatch. Yeah [laughs] It's not quick. No Hmm You want a chopping helper? Um they're pretty quick, actually. Okay. Okay You mean we could use a chopping helper? I I don't know if I would but We could. [laughs] Yeah that's what I was thinking. That's what I'm thinking too. We could do that. It's not quick. No But I would like to do it. [laughs] Yeah that's what I was thinking too. We can do that. It's not quick. No. Oh I see. Yeah Yeah [laughs] It's the it's the actual word. It's not quick. Usually if you chop it you it's not quick yet. Yeah Here you go. Oh the oh the wood chipper is so [inaudible 0:33:24.77] That's so
Um, yes, good, good evening everybody and um, welcome to um, the Wednesday evening live show. Um, I'm sure since we've all been in lockdown everybody's been watching carefully what's, um, what's going on in the garden. Um, I can't get it to move on. Thank you. And watching what birds are coming to garden more than we ever have before. Um, probably wondering what some of them are, wondering what they're doing ferreting about. And in this we're going to have a go through a few of the species you might have seen and um, what they're up to and what you can do to encourage more of them. Um, wonderful selection of birds using gardens regularly now. Why are gardens so important for birds? Industrial agriculture has taken away a lot of the habitats that birds traditionally used. Um, it's recent research shows that the total of UK private gardens covers an area nearly twice the size of Wales, which a huge amount of um, green space with lots and lots of variety in it, lots of insects, lots of plants and things, lots of fruits, which replaces to an extent what we've lost in the countryside. A quarter of the area of a typical city is in private gardens, lots and lots of green areas. Obviously all wildlife is appreciating it, but birds are the most visible. You can see them easily, they're easily recognised. So it doesn't matter what your garden's like, it could be a fairly traditional garden, large, small, modern garden, or even quite a tiny one. Even if you haven't got a garden, you can do something with um, perhaps feeders that stick on your window with um, suction cups or hanging outside the window where you can reach them to fill and empty them and bring birds in that way. Of course, there are accessibility you can see out into your garden you can see the birds you're there all the time you can see it, see them regularly it means that garden bird watching is an ideal subject for citizen science and uh, rspb have been running the big garden bird watch on one day in january every year since 1979 and there is also the british trust for ornithology garden bird watch scheme that Every, the people sub subscribe and put in records every week so it's a constant effort thing and these citizen science projects give us a tremendous amount of data about what the populations are doing how garden birds are changing how the use of gardens by birds is changing over the years so a lot of the data i'll be using comes from one or other of those surveys great thing to get the kids involved with as well they love watching birds you can make it home education you can do maths you can do geography all sorts of things revolving around garden birds so year round we have some of the birds will be the same this is one of the more familiar ones everybody knows what a robin looks like absolutely fabulous lovely little birds very friendly very confident of course formerly a woodland bird um, in a lot of continental Europe, they, they don't hang around in gardens nearly as much and they don't sit on your wheelbarrow or your shovel handle when you're gardening. You think it's because they love you, it's actually because they think you're a pig. Normally they'd be out in the forest, they'd be following the sounders of wild boar around and as the wild boar truffle about in the undergrowth, they disturb the insects, they turn over the earth and the robins can pick up the bits and pieces. So. Yep, he thinks you're a pig. Blackbirds, we all have blackbirds coming into the garden. For me, it's the sound of summer, that lovely mellow song of, of the blackbird. They do increase during the winter um, with more birds coming in um, from the continent, from Scandinavia. The song thrush. 
<coughs> there's an interesting thing about song thrushes. Is in 1996, they were reported in over half of the gardens contributing to Garden Bird Watch, but by 2020, in less than 15% of gardens. And that was in their peak month, which is January. So the population of song thrushes is pretty stable, but we don't know why they're giving up on gardens. Perhaps people are being a bit too handy with the uh, getting rid of the snails. These are the ones that, that, of course, use the anvil to break snails on, leaving a little scatter of snail shells around it. You know you've got a thrush if you've got that in your garden. Starlings are um, uh, red-listed. Uh, there's still quite a lot of them, but the population is declining rapidly. Probably more to do with the lack of nest nesting sites. Um, cleaning up uh, the farmyards and whatnot has made a lot of imp impact on them. They need holes to nest in. They like old buildings. So they're suffering a bit. They're brilliant in the garden because they eat the wild worms out of your lawn. So don't get cross with the starlings. You get a big mob at once because they're very sociable birds, but absolutely great things. Collared doves. You'd never have seen one of those before the 1950s. They're quite a recent addition to our avifauna. Um, rapid expansion in the Middle East brought them over here. In Germany, they're known as television aerial birds because that's where they're usually seen sitting. And the great tits and the blue tits, these are the acrobatic ones you see hanging upside down on your fat balls, um, on the peanut feeders, absolutely lovely little things. Unlike the robins, they're not strictly territorial. So if you see two robins, they're probably the two robins that live in your garden and you can call them your robins. If you've got 10 blue tits that come to your feeders, you've probably got 100 because they move around in flocks. They will use all the other feeders in the area. So they're not your ones. They're common property blue tits. Cold tits, similar. They'll move around in flocks with the other tits. In, in the winter particularly, you get mixed flocks of tits. These are the ones that take the seeds from your seed feeder, carry them away to eat, much safer that way. And they'll also cache seeds for times of shortage. Uh, can be a bit of an inconvenience. We had one that filled a hanging basket with sunflower seeds. Um, we couldn't understand why the petunias died and the sunflowers grew, but there we go. That's cold tits for you. Long-tailed tits, um, usually in little parties, family parties. Um, they look like little flying lollipops, um, always talking to each other as they move through the trees. Very keen on fat block. Um, they will use the seed feeders, but mine certainly particularly keen on, 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 on the fat blocks, fat balls and those fat tube things. The greenfinch. Now, these ones are decreasing rapidly. Numbers are down by 75% since 2006, when um, the outbreak of trichomonosis, I think that's right, um, is a particularly unpleasant disease of finches, and it really did impact the green finches terribly. So much less of them about now. Um, we do see them in the garden still, but not in such big numbers. And chaffinches also suffer from it. Uh, they get rather nasty warty growths around their beaks and feet and things and generally start looking terribly ill. Um, if you see a finch hanging around your garden looking terribly ill, that's probably the problem. Um, the, the chaffinches haven't de declined quite as much though. Goldfinches don't seem to have suffered from it. Um, they were rapidly declining in the 1980s because of um, changing agricultural practice. They feed on small weed seeds um, in the fallows and the stubbles. But since the 1990s, the numbers have increased again because they're using gardens now. There used to be a bird we didn't see in gardens very much, but diversification of garden bird, bird foods that are available has meant that these birds are using gardens. It used to be that you got a box of swoop, and that was about the only bird food you could buy. And it had grains in it and split peas and things didn't suit these smaller birds with more delicate beaks. <clears throat> now you can get the sunflower hearts and the niger seed 
and very popular with the green finch, uh, goldfinches. So they're much more common in gardens now. <coughs> Bullfinches are still not being seen very much in gardens, but numbers are increasing. So that's one to watch out for in the next few years, whether we're getting more of them. Woodpeckers, again, increasing in gardens. Fat blocks and peanuts very popular. And um, they can eat an awful lot. They, I mean, they, they will absolutely rob out your, your fat bull. The house sparrows, male at the top and the female at the bottom, um, another one that used to be a very, very common garden bird, still, still appearing in most gardens, but in much smaller numbers. Another one that suffered from alterations in farm buildings, um, cleaning up of grain stores, um, home building with plastic soffits rather than wooden, um, closing off all the access to um, attics and things. These are communal nesters. They like to have a lot of spaces they can all nest in together. We've got a, a porch roof that has one hole in it, but we ended up with four sparrows nests in the same porch roof and they were going in and out and in and out and in and out at an unbelievable rate. But it was because they had a whole little colony in there. It wasn't just one going back and forth very fast. <coughs> this is a dunnock. And these are rather an unassuming little bird. And you'll see them not on the bird feeder, but sneaking around under it and under your hedges and everything. It looks like a very dull, sort of well-behaved, nice little bird. They actually have a very colourful private life. But I'll leave you to look that up for yourself. Tree sparrows are another one that are increasing in gardens. Watch out for them moving into gardens. Um, another agricultural bird, really, farmland bird, which is being hit by the lack of seeds from weeds and stubbles. So this is one to watch for increasing use of gardens in the next few years. Nuthatch is also increasing in gardens. Very keen on some of the things offered on bird feeders. Uh, the peanuts, obviously, um, and, and, and the fat bulls. Um, they will eat almost anything. They're the only bird that can climb down a tree downwards. So tree creepers go up the tree, but then they have to fly down. These ones can go up or down. They're like a tiny little woodpecker and rather smart colours. Uh, one of my favourites, the wren. They have the really, really loud voice. Don't use bird feed as much, but you'll see them scuffling around around the bottom of your flower beds, around the bottom of the wall or under the hedge. Um, very small, need an awful lot of food, particularly in the winter to keep their temperatures up. And they also tend to cram into nest boxes to keep warm on winter nights. And the record was 61 wrens in a single nest box. Absolutely amazing. You can imagine that. This is our smallest British bird and we do get them in gardens. They like conifers. They'll use Leylandi hedges, they like yew trees. Uh, you might not see them, and if you're as old as I am, you probably won't hear them either. Very high-pitched noise. In the winter, we get flocks of them together, and you can actually have more of a chance to see them when the tree appears to be absolutely buzzing with them. And the last of this section are the jackdaw. Um, I think they're rather handsome. A lot of people don't like them. But if you do have them around, please make sure you put a cover on your chimney of some sort because otherwise you can end up with an extremely sooty jackdaw running around your living room. In the summer, we get a whole batch of new birds joining us. So these are black caps, the male at the top with the black cap, and the female is still a black cap, but it's got a red cap instead. Um, increasingly, they're not migrating out of the country in the winter, particularly in the south. They're, um, they're, they're actually overwintering here and they will use feeders. Chiff chaffs don't. They're one of the first migrants that get here. I always look forward to them. First so summer migrant song you hear, and then after a week you want to wring their necks because it's actually quite a tedious song. But sweet little birds. Swallows and martins decreasing with the um, climate change, increasing the size of the Sahara and impacting on the sub-Saharan area. They're um, not, 
not so easy for them to feed on their way to and from on migration and also there are less flying insects about um, you don't get nearly as many splattered on your windscreen when you're driving it's a really good indicator these are birds that spend all the time trolling for them up in the sky and if they're not there they do suffer and they come in and they're not in such good breeding condition and it can take them longer to get their their broods raised one way of helping those birds by the way is if in if it's a dry spring make a mud puddle for them because they like they need the mud to build the nests so you can always make a nice wet puddle in the winter we get a we lose the summer migrants we get another suite arriving from the north and the east including the uh, the northern thrushes the winter thrushes is a field fair and a red wing come in big flocks and feed largely on the hawthorn berries in the hedges and they will feed on fruit in the gardens these are all red wings and field fairs in our garden i always keep a box of windfall apples into the winter so that when the weather's like this i can throw the apples out and the winter thrushes will have some to feed on they get joined by missile thrushes song thrushes blackbirds i try to throw out one apple for every bird we have but they still fight over them um, the field fairs in particular can be quite aggressive siskins are a much more dainty thing they particularly like the niger seed but they will take um, sunflower hearts um, they have very fine beak and normally they'll be feeding on older seeds and birch seeds um, so little tiny seeds little tiny beaks they can't manage um, some of the harder grains so if you want siskins put out either either the naked sunflower hearts or niger seeds this is a brambling bramblings are very like chaffinches they will flock with chaffinches so it's always worthwhile in the winter to have a really good look at your flock of chaffinches in case it's got a few of these in about with them they're another one that's benefiting from the wider range of food that people are putting out and if you're really lucky Here's one you won't see on your bird feeder, but you might get on fruit trees in your garden. It's a waxwing. And if you don't get, in, get them in your garden, have a look in the nearest supermarket car park, because that seems to be where they always are. They rowans and cotoneasters and things, and they'll strip the whole tree. They come in flocks, the fall of waxwings, some years, not others, and they will come in huge numbers, settle on one tree, absolutely strip it naked. So that was a quick look at some of the birds that you might get and if we want to attract more well how are we going to do it there's a very wide range of bird feeders available now and different foods you can put out for them they don't really worry about what the design is the design is for the the person who's buying it the birds don't care but um, <clears throat> look for ones that are easy to clean easy to fill and um, try to fill them only as much as will be eaten quite quickly because you don't want stuff going off potentially spreading diseases so more variety you put out the more species you'll get and have a think about the calorific value birds don't diet they need as many calories as they can cram in sunflower hearts come in about 520 calories per 100 grams peanut cakes come in as about 690 so you know high calorie stuff really valuable for them and present it in different ways hanging feeder like this like a, a or a bird table will allow different birds from the ones that on the on the tube feeders or 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 a tray under the tube feeder will help and offer something for the ground feeders interestingly enough this picture hasn't got any specifically ground feeding birds on it it's it's being used by everything but the cage over it stops it all getting eaten by in our garden pheasants but also pigeons and things like that and um, things like sparrows and the chaffinches particularly like to have ground level food it's important to move it regularly um, keep it clean underneath um, it can attract rats so um, be careful with those and move them and keep them clean 
a diagram of um, who eats what and when. Most of most of the garden birds have a, a lull during the year when they're not using so much of the garden food. Um, partic the winter is particularly popular, but as you can see, some of them still taking good quantities of food through the breeding season. It's very important to keep feeding through the year because birds can still suffer shortages if it's a bad spring. And when they've got young, they can come to your bird feeder, stuff themselves silly first thing, and then they'll have lots of energy to collect the caterpillars and insects the chicks need. They don't tend to feed the chicks on stuff from the bird feeders unless they're really starving. But a good breakfast first thing and they've got all the energy they need to go and do some foraging. You can grow plenty of things in your garden that will be ideal food for the birds. Um, crab apples, cotoneasters, berberus, these sort of things. Particularly ivy is good because the berries on ivy of course are ripe early in spring rather than in the autumn so it's a different time scale for them and the birds can use them then when there's nothing else available. Water is also important particularly for seed feeding birds they need to drink keep, your, keep the water clean um, and fresh They'll use it for bathing as well. And in the winter, make sure you keep it defrosted or you will have disgruntled looking birds like this one. Where is my drink gone? Nesting birds in the garden, particularly attractive. You get to see the youngsters, you get to see the family behavior. Absolutely lovely. So what about providing some nesting places for them? Gardens are used as a breeding habitat by a lot of birds, as you can see here, sparrows 62% in human habitats, starlings 54%. These are the birds that are suffering from farms being tidied up, farm buildings being tidied up, converted into houses, this sort of thing. So particularly for these birds, offering some sort of nest box or somewhere they can use to breed is very important. There's a variety of nest boxes available to buy or to make yourself, you can reuse things like the uh, the boot and the teapot. Um, plenty of plans available online um, for, for making your own. And we sell a good selection of both the traditional wooden ones and the woodcrete ones here at Shropshire Wildlife Trust in the shop. Um, different species will use different types of box. So do try and work out what you've got in your garden that's likely to be using a box before you go and buy an expensive one that maybe you'll get nothing in. Um, same thing with the feeders really. <clears throat> I can remember a friend of mine seeing in the local garden centre a hummingbird feeder and she thought it'd be lovely because she put it in the garden. Hummingbirds would come. Um, she lived in Scotland. We don't have many hummingbirds in Scotland. You know it's if the birds aren't there, they're not going to come. So make something suitable for the birds you've got. House martins have suffered with um, plastic soffits and things not so suitable for them to nest on. This is a set of woodcrete artificial house martin boxes. And they, they do use them. They're perfectly happy with them. This is a bunch of robins that nested on a shelf in our garage. Um, they all fledged well. There are actually six in there, but you can't, you can't quite see all of them. Um, it meant we couldn't go in and out of the garage for a while though. But I'm going to put up a nice robin box on the outside of the garage in the hope that they'll use that instead. This is the um, the end of my garden. This is a, actually a, a Victorian earth closet. We don't use it much these days. Um, when we moved in, it was quite smart and respectable. But since then, I've let it grow ivy. And now it provides nesting sites for dunnocks, wrens, robins, all sorts of things. It's absolutely brilliant. So a little bit of untidiness, a little bit of colour, cover in the garden, and you'll be surprised what comes to nest there. These are a few ways you can actually make a difference. Rather than putting up an artificial nest box, 
you can improve trees and shrubs by making little cabins in them or pruning them in particular ways <clears throat> and um, hopefully then get things like tree creepers using your garden where previously you haven't and what could be nicer than seeing some of these young birds this juvenile robin here hopping around enjoying your garden so which are the ones that you don't want in your garden it's surprising how many unpopular visitors there are wood pigeons are using gardens increasingly they're very very common species to have in garden a lot of people don't like them they say they eat everything um, personally i think they make a lovely sound and um, they don't really eat that much they can't really manage very well a, a, a small bird table particularly if it has a roof or you can put a cage over things to exclude these larger birds um, same with feral pigeons we don't suffer them too much at home but um, in certainly in the cities feral pigeons can, can be a, a, a problem coming in and eating all the food all at once again caged feeders would be the answer to that sparrow hawks very unpopular people tend to get quite attached to their little garden birds and then they get a sparrow hawk comes in and um, steals one of them in front of them um, they sparrow hawks and small birds evolve together they won't eat all of them they they can't afford to they'd starve then um, I get quite a buzz from seeing one flying through the garden I, I, I rather like them and they've got this wonderful fierce gl glare of the, the yellow eyes um, the more you, if you're feeding birds you'll get, have a lot a lot more birds together in your garden at, at, at one time there's more eyes to see these predators coming give an alarm call quite often the sparrowhawk leaves empty-handed um, we had a bunch of greenfinches once feeding on a one of those tube feeders with it with a cage over it um, they all, sparrow hawk came along they all flew away apart from one and it thought it was safe in the cage and the sparrow hawk landed on the top of the cage stuck its leg through the bars and grabbed the green finch so that was one which was obviously too stupid to continue passing on its genes don't worry about the sparrow hawks they're not going to kill everything magpies can be a problem taking people say oh they've eaten all the they take the chicks they take the eggs again they evolved with the other birds they're not going to do that much damage you can always bang the window and frighten them away and jays the same they will take nests but in their you know they're feeding their own young they've all got to survive too and they are the most splendidly handsome bird so don't be too hard on the jays uh, squirrels um, I'm not quite sure how this one got into the cage but um, they can not only take eggs and nests they can also wreck your bird feeders so um, they're possibly one to to hate but you can make them do ever such exciting and interesting things they're very clever at learning their way around ways to exclude squirrels so if you make it into competition between you and the squirrels um, see how long you can keep the squirrel out of your feeder put up an obstacle course for them they can be quite entertaining and just be glad you don't have these uh, in big cities with the thermal island that you get the warm warmer in cities these ring neck parakeets are getting quite common um, they can't often make a mess of your peanut feeders they've got beaks that are like tin openers and they will actually completely wreck the mesh um, this it always made made me laugh we, we we had people would come in and tell me about the dreadful magpie and the dreadful jay and the dreadful sparrowhawk but we've got a wonderful woodpecker these will also take eggs and nests of course um, sometimes it's not enough to put a metal plate on the hole of the nest box because the woodpecker will just go around the side of it and go in that way they can hear the young in the nest calling and they'll stop at nothing to get them the only way around it is to get wood creek nest boxes 
or completely cover your nest box with a fairly thin wire, you know, close, close woven, um, what do you call stuff? Chicken wire type stuff, you know. Um, and that, that might work, but um, again, they have their own young to feed and they they all evolve together, so don't be too hard on them. They are spectacular. So why are we bothering? Why are we doing all this for the garden birds? Um, you know, surely they're out there in the countryside, they're doing the stuff, they ought to be perfectly all right. But actually, it's very good for the birds if you, you feed them. Particularly in the winter, a lot of them need to forage right through the day just to get enough food to stay alive and even in the springtime they can be facing shortage so keep feeding all year round and you might save many lives so much pressure on birds from the way the countryside has changed um, they're looking on gardens as a replacement habitat so they they come to i mean not not rely on provided food but certainly much higher populations can survive where more food is provided but it's good for you as well there's nothing better you need to expose your to nature to keep us happy to keep us healthy and i'm sure with the lockdown that we've all been through people will have un understandably suffered from anxiety um, tension about things and just being outside or just looking outside at the garden at the birds one reduces your blood pressure makes your breathing better improves your mood improves your mental health and all these things so absolutely vital to have that contact by feeding the birds You've brought them to you. You can see them. The Shropshire Wildlife Trust Feed the Birds project, tackling social isolation by connecting vulnerable people with local volunteers. They, before lockdown, were visiting once a week, bringing the bird food, fill, filling the bird feeders, and talking to the, the their clients, if you like, about what they're seeing in the garden. Of course, lockdown rather finished all that, but we've continued to um, provide the food. Um, we've had around 50 volunteers, there's a one-to-one -one with, with clients. Food's been provided into the gardens. Relatives and friends helping, assisting the vulnerable people have been filling up the feeders and our volunteers have stayed in touch with them on the telephone. Um, we're also um, responded to the, the the feelings of isolation and feelings of of, of, of um, the the lockdown anxiety by providing bird feeder kits to the socially isolate, isolated and over, around five hundred kits now have been distributed to different households and individuals through Shropshire. It's been an absolutely marvellous thing to give people something to look forward to and to enjoy during, during lockdown. And what could be better for your mental health than seeing something like this? This is a sunbathing wren and it, doesn't it look like it's enjoying itself? Keep everything clean. Obviously birds like us suffer from viruses. And, uh, infections so everything should be washed do it outside keep a special bowl for it wear rubber gloves keep your own health is equally important quite a lot of available specially made disinfectants that you can they're ready to use you can spray on or you could use diluted um, Milton the sort of stuff you use for cleaning baby equipment the sort of thing so everything nice and clean water baths as well so the birds aren't passing because there's more birds coming together at the feeding station there's more chance of infections being passed on so if you keep everything clean there's less chance of that happening and keep it safe 
Think about where you position your bird feeder. It wants to be where the birds can see all round. They'll feel safe. They, they'll spot the sparrowhawk coming in, keep them away from cat, where the cat could ambush them. Any fences or trees the cats can hide behind or jump out of. So make the bird feeder somewhere nice and safe. Uh, there's one of the culprits. Um, he's quite old now, he can't actually jump very far, so it's not so much of a problem. But uh, do watch out, especially, I mean, these tall fences you get around gardens in, in the States, cats can actually creep along them, jump down onto the birds on the feeder. So be very careful how you position your feeders. And just be glad that we don't have any of these. If you've enjoyed this evening's presentation um, or any of the previous ones, um, you've perhaps been out, visited our reserves while you've been on, on lockdown. Um, over 40 reserves that you could have been to. Do try, have a think, make a difference, join the Wildlife Trust. Individual or joint membership, sort of adults only, is from £3 a month which is less than a Big Mac and a Coke, if you think about it, or a fancy coffee and a slice of cake. Families for £5 or over a month. 93 pence of every pound is spent on looking after Shropshire Wildlife directly. And every pound we receive allowed from, uh, from memberships allows us to raise a further £6.50 in grants. So really worthwhile thing to do very positive thing you can do. If you do nothing else for nature ever, that would be an absolutely great thing to do. So have a think about it. Thank you very much. Oh. Oh. Have I done that wrong? Off? Sorry, that was me. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, we've some questions have come in. Um, somebody has sent in, what is the smallest British bird? And that would be the gold crest that we saw earlier on. Fire crests are nearly as small, but not quite. So the tiniest one is a gold crest. What is the strangest bird you've ever had in your garden? Strangest bird. I looked out of my kitchen window a couple of years ago, straight onto the bird feeder, not very far away from the window, and I saw a hawfinch. And I couldn't believe it at first. I did a sort of double take, looked again. No mistaking it, it's got the great big steel blue beak. Absolutely marvellous looking thing. Very handsome bird. And it's there feeding on the seed feeder. Never seen one before anywhere. Never seen one anywhere in the countryside. Nothing like that. But there was one sitting on my seed feeder. We had a raven the other day hopping about on the driveway. And... About three years ago, I was sitting having my breakfast and a red kite flew through the garden, ground floor level, doing all the sort of twisty turny thing with its tail, straight past. They look huge from that close. I couldn't believe how big it was. Um, it was amazing. I, just, I nearly dropped my cornflakes. But those, those are my strangest birds. Um, should I feed birds fat from the kitchen? from meat, for example. Now, this is one you have to be quite careful with. Things like um, boiled ham, if you boiled a ham yourself, you think, well, that's a lovely big bit of fat. Um, it's very salty, so not suitable. Fairly hard fats, like beef dripping, and um, it may be from a pork joint, are quite suitable. But the fats that you get run off from cooking chicken or turkey are never hard enough so if you put those out the birds tend to get them all over their um all over the feathers they can't clean them off properly they can't which which, which means they can't, they don't insulate properly so they they look like they'd be a good food source but in actual fact can do more harm than good um you can make your own fat balls fat blocks um, with beef dripping or, or um, a pork dripping would do <clears throat> but mix them up with lots of lots of um, 
ground up maybe ground up peanuts or breadcrumbs or stale biscuit or something like this so they go nice and solid and then the birds don't get covered in it to quite the same extent but do avoid turkey fat chicken fat those sort of fats thank you well that's um the last of our questions so thank you very much for joining us today do have another think about joining up to the wildlife trust every penny helps and don't forget join us again next wednesday for our next wild wednesday presentation I'm not quite sure what it is yet i'm sure it'll be very exciting when it comes so thank you very much Are we okay?